So tonight, I'm sorry if you're eating. Dr. Casaña has already introduced sort of the topic or the symptoms related to the topic. Um, but at some point, this disease was called the gypsy when they didn't know exactly what was going on. Another name was the blue death because people would, would change colors, the skin would change colors because of the dehydration. Uh, also, the summer fever because of when it's uh, usually happening. So we're going to talk about cholera today, and this is a picture on the right side uh, of electron microscopy of cholera, a uh, fancy picture with all the colors there. So I was thinking about this. Um, I was like, I'll tell this to my wife, but she didn't laugh, actually. My love for you is like diarrhea. Um, I just can't hold it in. But um, she didn't find it funny. So going back to the history of cholera, um, in Latin, cholera is biliary disease, mainly came from Greek, uh, coli, that means bile. <clears throat> so cholera actually has a rich history because it has been around for many, many years, uh, centuries actually. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of cholera. I think it's interesting. Um, and you see two faces that you might recognize. Uh, one is Hippocrates and the other one is Buddha. And there are ancient texts that talk about cholera in those times, in the times of Hippo Hippocrates and Buddha as well. So you're going to see that it has ancient origins. Around 1563, actually, there are Sanskrit texts and uh, an Indian uh, research report or medical research report from that time. And then in 1817, you see that modern history of cholera starts, um, and actually starts in India, around the uh, Ganges uh, Delta, the Ganges River Delta, and that's kind of the cholera timeline before modern history of cholera. The modern history of cholera is actually the seven pandemics that we have uh, gone through in the whole world, and you have the pandemics, the first one in 1817, as I said, and it lasted to about 1824, and these are red dots here, uh, you basically see it in Asia, Southeast Asia, Middle East, uh, Africa. And then the second one in 1828 to 1834, it actually goes to Europe and North America. And most of them are going to be on those territories. The third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, to the seventh uh, one, that is the seventh one that is actually the one that we're currently in. Uh, this one started in 1961. And actually, that one had a more prominent, um, prominent, was more prominent in Latin America and parts of Africa and Southeast Asia. You don't see that one so much in uh, US or Northern Europe. Probably the most important one in regards to the discovery of cholera and the origins of cholera is the third one. And you're going to see why. There are three people that I think impacted more the discovery of cholera. And one was Filippo Pacini in Italy, in Florence, around 1853, 1854. He was an anatomy pathologist, and he actually discovered this organism in the intestines of uh, people that died from it. Then in 1854, 1855, John Snow, many of you know the story, and I'm going to tell you the story in a minute. And then Robert Koch, that you actually know him well uh, from different discoveries that he made, but he actually isolated Vibrio cholerae in Calcutta in 1883. So what happened with Jon Snow, and actually Dr. Ehler knows the story really well, because he was in London and he took a picture of the pump, um, but this is sort of a map that he actually created in 1853-1854. He was an epidemiologist, he was an anesthesiologist, or had some studies in anesthesiology, and an OBGYN doctor as well. But he was amazed because a lot of people were dying in this area of London, it's Soho, you know Soho here in, in New York, many Sohos after this Soho in London. Um, so this is Broad Street, and he saw that all the people that were dying in Soho were around this water pump. Um, there were many other water pumps, and there were some scattered deaths uh, close to the other ones, but he actually found out that these people that died had also had gotten water from the Broad Street pump. Um, so they had some relationship to that one. So he proposed 
to the uh, politicians of that uh, era that um, the pump was causing the deaths or what was related to that because the water from there was probably contaminated with something. And he uh, tested the water and they didn't believe him much, but after uh, trying many times, uh, he got the police to remove the handle for the pump. And uh, incredibly, the cases started diminishing. So he was probably the first one that uh, postulated that cholera was actually a waterborne disease in 1855. So here is a uh, plaque um, that uh, recognized that he was the one that uh, uh, discovered this, and that's the, the water pump or a replica of the water pump uh, from that time, without the handle, of course. And this is a Jon Snow pub that is in that corner as well. So I was thinking, who is the Jon Snow of our era, right? And there is someone here that is in charge of epidemiology, right? Has some studies related to diarrhea, not in cholera, but in CDF. And his name is also John. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a John Tony pub, but I just had the John Snow his pub. Hair reminds they... us of snow. Right, yeah. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So we have our own Jones now. We should appreciate that. So from that time, some <laughs> some funny cartoons from that time, death dispensing the water, usually attacking the poor, unfortunately, and then the newspapers uh, n not to drink any water which has not previously been boiled uh, when things were starting to change. So in regards to epidemiology, Talking about the seventh pandemic, we have about three to five million cases per year worldwide, and about 100,000, 100 to 150,000 deaths per year. Um, this current pandemic in 1961 started around the Bay of Bengal, and we're going to talk about the zero groups of cholera, but the current one is the one called the Tor, that is part of the zero group one. It's not the classic variety; it's, it's a Tor variety, um, as we're going to see. So. Uh, this is from the World Health Organization from 2013, and you can see here that um, by colors we have the areas, and America is actually the purple one. And you're going to see that in the 90s is when uh, it attacks South America more. There's when we have more cases around Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador, and around the 2010, 11, and 12 in Haiti, and we're going to see why. This is another graph. Um, with the distribution from 2010 to 2014. And again, we have Africa, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and Haiti and Dominican Republic that are uh, very close by. So Haiti, again, uh, you cannot see it well probably, but the uh, blue areas are the ones that have been more affected, and you see it widespread all over the country. The uh, purple and orange areas are also very affected and have many cases of uh, cholera. So it's all over the country. So how did cholera get to Haiti this time? I don't know if you remember, but in 2010 there was a big earthquake. Um, so many people went and helped. And one of the ways it got to Haiti was because um, UN officials from Nepal went to Haiti carrying the uh, uh, bacteria. And they this is important because they were asymptomatic carriers. They were not having active disease. They just went there to help. And when they, um, when they obviously defecated in being in Haiti, uh, with the poor sanitation and the unsafe waters after the earthquake, this uh, propagated. Um, so, uh, people, how many people had cholera in Haiti in 2010? Around 600,000. How many people died in Haiti in 2010? About 7,500. So what are the risk factors talking about how it hit Haiti? Uh, for transmission, we have poor access to safe water, poor sanitation, uh, practice of open defecation. And in some cultures, it is that way because of the lack of infrastructure, uh, poor hygiene practices like hand washing or washing food, crowded settings, um, seasonal upsurges, mainly when it's warm, uh, and displacement or population movements will also bring from one place to the other. Now, risk factors for severe disease and uh, death, lack of immunity, 
like children, uh, non-endemic in non-endemic settings, underlying conditions like uh, malnutrition, elderly, children, pregnant patients, HIV patients, cancer patients, and lack of access, of course, of, to uh, early uh, diagnosis and treatment. And one important one, uh, blood group O. I didn't know about this, but it's, uh, when you are blood group O, you tend to have more severe disease. And they don't know exactly why. I was actually trying to research this, and there are many articles that try to explain it at a molecular level or an ant antibody level, and they think that antibodies uh, to blood A, AB, and, uh, and B, of course, um, they bind to the uh, bacteria and the toxin, so it attacks the colon less because it's binding to these antibodies. O doesn't have this property, that's why it attacks, it attacks the colon of these patients more. But this is just you know, a hypothesis. It's not a proven theory. Uh, and the other thing that is important, they found that in a household, first degree relatives are more prone to have severe disease as well, and siblings have uh, more chances to get cholera. They don't know the exact reason why, but it is that way. So these guys were, they go to the gym too much, so they don't know how to write stuff. Um, so it's just something that I thought was funny. And then classification is a, a motile and, and unipolar gram-negative rod. It's an oxidase positive, uh, facultative anaerobe, and it has, as I said, many serogroups, around 200 serogroups. Uh, the most important ones being 0, 01 that caused most of these pandemics until 1922. And one of the last ones that was uh, found is 0, 0139. Uh, and that one also causes uh, can, can cause big outbreaks uh, and pandemics, but not as severe as 01 usually. El Tor is one of the uh, biotypes of the 01 zero group that is causing the current pandemic. And important factor in this um, condition is the cholera toxin. Here you can see many of the different zero groups and when they were discovered. So the pathogenicity. Uh, this is something that I call the ecosystem of cholera. And you have these states and the lighter color. Uh, uh, Vibrio cholera as a free living uh, cultural organism, as a micro colony or biofilm. You have the host that are humans, and those are the only vertebrate uh, hosts. And then you have the associations like contaminated water and foods like fish, uh, crustaceans, protozoa, algae from the sea. And you have the uh, foes as well that kill cholera. There are bacteriophages, protozoa, and bacteria. And just as a side um, thing, uh, cholera is not dependent on humans for propagation, but it's, uh, humans are the only vertebrate host. So the transmission is fecal oral, as you know. Um, humans, this is important because fecal oral, um, when humans are, have the condition, they can excrete up to 20 liters per day if it's severe cholera. And you excrete 10 to the 9 cells per milliliter per day. So it's a huge amount. And yeah, you need high infectious doses, but if you're excreting that much and you're close to these patients and if the water is contaminated, you're going to have high dose. Now, if your pH, if your acid, stomach acid is lower, you need a lower dose because it's easier for the bacteria to go through. So after you ingest it, it has good capacity to survive the acid and more when you have low amounts of acid, then it multiplies in the small bowel, and then in, in the large bowel, it is not going to be invasive, but it's going to be toxigenic. It's going to create a toxin, right? So what does it create, or what? how does it work in the colon? It has a pili and a toxin, and I'm going to talk about these a little bit, and these are not expressed all the time. They are expressed when signals trigger it, in, when, when it's inside of the human body. So the pila is important because of three factors. As I said, it's not an invasive bacteria. It colonizes more than anything. So this pila permits an, an interaction between bacteria and bacteria. It also gives protection to the bacteria against the toxicity of the colon, and then attach, helps with the attachment to the epithelium. And then we have the toxin, and the toxin has two subunits, A and B. B is the one that will attach to the uh, receptor in the cell membrane of the epithelial cells of the colon and will open the door for A 
and A will actually increase the adenylate cyclase activity and uh, the CAMP that is a derivative, as you know, derivative uh, from ATP to increase the pumps and they will start working more. So from the cell out to the lumen, uh, sodium, water, chloride, potassium, and bicarb will form the content of the diarrhea. So that's how it works and that's how you get dehydrated and you lack all of, this, all of these electrolytes. So from these, we go to the manifestations and the main ones are uh, the rice water diarrhea that you can see here. And it's rice water because it has mucus in it. Um, so you can see it as whitish um, as, as the rice water. Then vomiting, mental status changes. Sometimes you can have fever. Sometimes you can have hypothermia, uh, mainly when, when the disease is severe and you've been very dehydrated. And probably the main one is dehydration, right? That's, that's the uh, worst complication of cholera. So, uh, as I said, the most severe type is cholera gravis or severe cholera, and it's going to be caused mainly by zero group one, more, even more than Eldor. And this is when you excrete more than a liter per hour. So that would mean about 20 to 25 liters per day, which is huge. So dehydration can cause hypotension, can cause ATN, can cause mental status changes from uh, confusion, restlessness, and lethargy to coma. And of course, skin changes, like the blue discoloration of the skin, mottled skin, increased skin turgor, skin tenting um, that you will see in these patients. Also, there are changes in the lab, and mainly hypokalemia, as you know, with diarrhea, well, and hyponatremia, but you will also have hypoglycemia because we're losing glucose, hypocalcemia, low bicarb, hypochloremia, and because of the low bicarb, we'll have lactic acidosis as well. So how do we diagnose cholera? Clinically, there are two, two uh, criteria. If you are five years old or older and you have severe dehydration, whatever you are, you can consider cholera. If you are two years or older and you are, you're having diarrhea and you're in an endemic area, then you consider cholera as well. How do you confirm it? Basically with cultures. Um, and there are two different media, the thiosulfate citrate, bile salt, sucrose, or the taurocholerate, uh, gelatin agar. I try to, I try to remember those. Um, and then when you confirm an outbreak, you don't need a culture. Um, you just know that there is an, an endemic area and most of the patients will, will come with the same symptoms of cholera. You can also use antibodies, and the antibodies will basically inhibit the motility. Uh, they are sensitive and specific, about 60 to 100 percent, depending on which one you use. And then you can use dark field microscopy that actually forms like a shooting star with the uh, flagellum and the head of the bacteria. And then there are rapid assays that they created for underdeveloped uh, countries that will work very quickly at antibody antigen interaction for 0, 01 and 0, 0139 zero groups. So this is the microscopy from uh, gram stain and dark field microscopy. And you can see, I don't know if you can imagine the shooting star, but it's there. Um, this is a nerdy type of joke. Center for Disease Control, please watch your strep. So it's a little nerdy. Um, so what about the management of cholera? 80% of patients recover uh, with proper therapy. But if they don't have uh, proper therapy, 50% will actually die. So the most important part in the management is volume assessment. And when we assess the volume, we're going to have mild or no dehydration, some or moderate dehydration from 5 to 10% losses, and severe dehydration more than 10%. And we'll follow five criteria clinically, mentation, eyes, skin trigger, pulse, and thirst. Of course, if you're alert, normal eyes, normal skin trigger, it's probably mild, normal pulse. If you are restless, sunken eyes, slow recall, but less than two seconds, rapid uh, pulse, and you are thirsty and wanting to drink all the time, this is probably moderate or some. And when you are severe, uh, in severe dehydration, you are lethargic, you are comatose, uh, sunken eyes, very slow recall, more than two seconds, uh, weak or absent pulse, and you drink poorly or you are unable to drink if you are comatose. But before we replace fluids, we have to know how much we lose. 
an adult with cholera, and this is important, sodium is lost uh, at about 130 millimoles per liter, potassium around 20, chloride around 100, and bicarb around 45. If you see here, they make a comparison, and in kids it's similar, uh, but non-cholera, they lose about half the sodium. They, lose, they can lose some more potassium, but they lose a quarter of the chloride and less than half of the bicarb that we lose with cholera. So this is important for the replacement. Now, how do we replace? If, uh, if it's mild or no dehydration, we just replace the ongoing losses. So when the patient gets thirsty, you just give them orally uh, the replacement. And you will observe until assured that the uh, ongoing losses are being ad adequately replaced. Now, if it's moderate, you can either use oral or intravenous route. If the patient is drinking enough, you're replacing in about three, four, three to four hours, and you will replace the ongoing losses again, plus 75 mLs per kg. Um, and you will also observe if you are uh, rehydrating them well. And if it's severe, you are going to replace the ongoing losses plus 100 mLs per kg as rapidly as possible, obviously intravenously if the patient is in a coma, um, and then give the remainder of the fluids within three hours. Once circulation is reestablished, you have to monitor every one to two hours to see how the hydration status is going. So the oral solution, what we try to create is an equimolar concentration of glucose and sodium because glucose will help absorbing in the colon. Now, there are different oral uh, rehydration solutions. There is a rice base that can actually decrease the, the stool uh, losses and the duration of the severe diarrhea. And when you use these solutions, actually, they can work for many other gastroenteritis because, as you saw, the uh, losses with the electrolytes uh, are less than when you have cholera, so you can replace it with any of these. So there is a, a ORS from oral solution from uh, World Health Organization. It has about 75 millimoles of sodium, 20 of potassium, 65 of chloride, and bicarb. And there is also a rice base that has about the same. And they also have uh, carbohydrates to actually increase the absorption in the colon. There is an emergency one that is the homemade base, but it, also, it only has sodium and uh, chloride with some, with some uh, carbohydrates. This is how you prepare it. Six uh, teaspoons of sugar a half teaspoon of salt, and a liter of water. You mix it, and ideally, you can add potassium sources like bananas or coconut juice. Now, if you're in a severe case, and you need intravenous solutions, what uh, would be ideal in a hospital like TGH would be uh, lactator ringers with dextrose to put some carbohydrate there, and some potassium, because lactator ringers will only have sodium, sodium chloride and bicarb, but not much potassium or glucose. Normal saline, you just use for circulatory support. Actually, it doesn't have any potassium or bicarb. And there is one that is called cholera saline that was created in endemic areas, and it's actually very similar to lactator ringers, but it all also has uh, glucose, so you need to add D5. And it has more potassium as well. Now, antibiotics that we like being ID doctors, uh, we try to avoid them, but we like them, right? So the main antibiotics that um, would help in cholera cases would be macrolides and fluoroquinolones. They used to say that tetracyclines helped, but actually many endemic areas have shown uh, resistance. So now mainly acitromycin and erythromycin, and acitromycin is the preferred one because you can use a single dose for adults and for kids as well. And then fluoroquinolones, ciprofloxacin, but the resistance is growing in many um, endemic areas. So antibiotics, they have a secondary role. Usually will decrease the duration of the disease and will limit secondary transmission. And you will use it only since it's secondary role for severe and unresponsive cases. Now, what do you do with pregnant uh, or breastfeeding patients? usually use macrolides, erythromycin or citromycin. For prevention of cholera, as you know, the main thing is safe water and sanitation. And this was a nice uh, mural in Haiti created by, uh, by Doctors Without Borders. Drink chlorinated or boiled water. Wash hands with soap after using the toilet and before eating. Always use a latrine or toilet, no open defecation. Eat hot and cooked food and also wash fruits and plates with uh, chlorinated water. 
So I think that that reflects what uh, prevention for cholera would be. So in, safe, in regards to safe water, World Health Organization in 2014 uh, basically said that 800 million people lack safe water still, and 2 billion people lack proper sanitation. To help these, there are vaccines that are used in endemic areas, and there are two oral vaccines, Ducorel, that will attack uh, 0, 01 and l 2 uh, zero groups, and Shankol, that will attack 0, 01 and uh, 0139. And they are about 80% effective, but they only last for two years, unfortunately. So just a little graph on how um, uh, sanitation improved in Latin America. The only country that actually didn't improve and it got even worse after 2010 was, was Haiti, unfortunately. And just to finish, um, I didn't know there was a World Toilet Day. Uh, this year is actually November 19, if you are interested. And basically, it tries to push for better sanitation because there are about 45 to 50 countries that have um, that lack proper sanitation in, in more than half the population. So uh, that's uh, pushed by World Health Organization. And that's basically it. If you have any questions, these are my references. Thank you.